a quick slide on what IoT is. A lot of confusion about it. So whenever there's confusion, we just, just go to Wikipedia. Uh, Internet of Things, actually not things. Uh, it's an interconnection of embedded computing devices within existing internet uh, infrastructure. So when you connect a device, embedded device, uh, it essentially becomes Internet of Things. Um, and by 2020, there's going to be like 26 to 30 billion connected devices. That's like you know, three to four times the amount of people on the planet Earth. So a lot of connected devices. So, <clears throat> uh, but a lot of people have this question about what about security, right? And um, first question you should ask is who cares, right? right? Uh, but if we look at a survey that was done, actually there's a little source at the bottom you can't see, but I'll give you the slides. Uh, people actually do care about IoT security, apparently. Uh, it's the number one concern that they have uh, amongst a lot of other concerns. And so I thought that was actually pretty promising. Uh, I thought that was kind of cool. Although it's less than 50%, it's only like 38%. Um, I thought that was kind of neat that security is actually one of the top concerns when it comes to IoT. So, um, but why should we care really from a technical standpoint? Privacy, I think a lot of people talk about that already. Uh, but there's moving parts, right? So uh, cyber to physical is no longer just an AOL chat room. Uh, it's something that people can actually do with embedded devices. Uh, it's asymmetric. I said it. It's asymmetric. Uh, but what I really mean by that is uh, the offensive stuff, the stuff when, we, when it comes to exploiting these devices, the knowledge is actually really high. Uh, but when it comes to defending these devices, the knowledge is actually very low. It's same with the tool sets and the methodologies uh, and just the approaches that we have. Uh, and then there's the last piece, which is PSYOPs. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that here in a second. But uh, this is what we're going to talk about, a car wash. Working at the car wash. I, I've always wanted to do that in a talk. So, um, and I'm not talking about the high school car wash that you pay people money to. I'm talking about like an industrial car wash uh, that you take your car through that's essentially a robot that's going to wash your car for you. Uh, we're going to look at one, a specific one that I thought was pretty interesting. So that car wash is actually an embedded device. Uh, the one that I looked at is, actually runs Windows CE on an ARM processor, right? It's just an embedded device, really what it is. Uh, the specific version that I looked at actually has a HTTP web server, um, and we knew that because it's running this RB HTTP 22.dll, which is actually like an intrinsic rainbow web server, which I thought was pretty neat. Uh, all the web server calls are actually calling to ARM DLLs, unmanaged ARM DLLs, like written in, in C++. So normally when you look at a web application, uh, you don't need to worry about things like buffer overflows and that sort of stuff. Uh, but with this particular device, every single web call that you can make, you have to worry about things like that. Uh, which is pretty interesting. It supports something called BGI, which is the binary gateway interface. Um, it's like CGI, but it's cooler, right? Uh, and I'll, I'll show you kind of how that works here in a second. The main goal for this web interface, uh, from what I could tell, I, I know I didn't talk to the designer, but from what I could tell, is to take all the physical components, like as if you were actually standing at a car wash trying to service or maintain it or operate it, and basically make those remote operations. And so if we take a look at the left here, there's actually this joystick uh, that you can use to actually control the car wash if you need to manually take it over. Uh, and there's basically three axes that you can control, right? So when you drive your car into a car wash, uh, there's actually a bridge that can push something over your car, right? But there's also another component that can actually move things in front of you uh, from side to side. And then the last axis is the thing that actually is washing your car. It can actually rotate, right? So I thought those were pretty interesting. And that's how you, this is how you would control these, uh, this is how you can, would control the bridge and the trolley, is what they call it, uh, from a physical standpoint, if you had actually have physical access. Um, and when I talked about those unmanaged ARM DLLs, these are the ar unmanaged ARM DLLs. So whenever you make a call to the web interface that's on this device, uh, you're basically going to call one of these DLLs and pass arguments to this DLL. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you how that works. So if you're on the web interface, it's kind of hard to see up there, but you'll see the URL. You'll, you'll call a DLL. So you'll say, hey, I want reports, right? So you'll say, report that DLL. And then the URI or the URL uh, parameters that are in the get request or post request essentially get passed to uh, rbhttp22, which does some authentication for you, uh, which essentially just looks up this file and says, hey, is this person allowed to do this thing? Uh, and then if it says you are, what it'll do is actually hand you off to a different DLL, in this case, report DLL. And then report, it's report DLL's responsibility to basically make sure that everything's sanitized and everything's good to go before it processes a particular movement. So for anyone that does any, any type of security research, a lot of opportunity to mess things up, right? A lot of opportunity to mess things up. A uh, lot of opportunity for uh, code execution bugs via memory corruption. Um, so every single web call is an opportunity to basically have buffer overflow. Um, but we're going to talk about some things that are basically just built into the design. So uh, these are the credentials that are built into this device. There's an owner account. The username is literally owner. Uh, it's a five-character password. Um, if you had three guesses, you would probably guess what the five-character password is. Um, there's also an engineering account called PDQ Engineering. PDQ is the, 
the name of the company, which the car wash I actually looked at. I'm not trying to pick on them. I'm sure the other car wash is just as bad, but uh, this one's pretty bad. The owner has full control, including free car washes, right? Because that's what everyone wants to know about. Uh, and the engineering has all the engineering control, but they can't access sales and they can't access free car washes. So if you want to uh, compromise one of these accounts, the owner is probably the one that you want to go for. Um, considering the creds that are issued with these devices, owner and PDQ engineering, uh, along with one other common misconfiguration, which is leaving the WinCE Telnet uh, service open, which actually just drops you into a shell on the device. Um, that accounts for almost 50% of the device that we see on the internet. So if you know what the default password is for the owner account, if you know what the default password is for PDQ engineering, uh, and if you know how to Telnet to uh, Telnet service, uh, you could own up to almost 50% of the devices that we see on the internet. So. Um, this is what the web interface looks like. This is where they store all the users. Uh, you can change these passwords. Uh, thankfully, I guess about maybe, you know, 50% of the people who have these devices have. Uh, that's a good thing, right? Very good thing. So uh, this is what the main page looks like. It's going to tell you a little bit about the information, a little information about uh, what you're looking at. Um, and then, you know, there's some things that you can do. Like, for example, you can set it up to send emails, right? So, yeah, I said it. Your car wash can send emails, right? True uh, true automation there, it's awesome. Uh, what kind of emails? You know, sales reports, uh, I'm broken, fix me, that sort of stuff. Uh, I thought that was kind of cool, actually. Um, if you go to the main page, it's going to give you some status. Um, it's go also going to show you a Facebook feed. So, yes, your, your car wash is on Facebook. Uh, that's pretty awesome, too. Um, uh, but if you look at, like, uh, what's actually capable from just a design standpoint, what is this thing from a by design standpoint can I do uh, if I'm able to log into it or shell into it or exploit a buffer, buffer overflow uh, in one of the DLLs. And so these are some of the things, the commands that you can actually issue, right? And so I, I thought this was pretty interesting. So, for example, this is the first question that everyone always asks when we talk about owning car washes. How do I get a free car wash, right? And it's literally just make one get request uh, to that DLL and say, hey, instant one, instant one issues you the first uh, registered car wash package in there, and the thing will start, it'll run a car wash for you. Right? Simple as that. Um, we were like, well, you know what? I don't really like the current configuration uh, of how this is set up. Um, so, you know, maybe I want to soap at the very, very end without rinsing, right? <laughs> Which I think would be kind of neat. This is how you would adjust your package here, right? So if you said, hey, you know what? I really need three rinses instead of one. Uh, this is how you would do that in the interface. But the reality is, is that all it is is an HTTP post request, right? So this is how you would essentially modify an existing package. If you knew what the package name was, like so for example, the package name is Superwash number one. You know, you know there's a, the, the ghetto car wash, the kind of cool car wash, then there's the premium car wash that you can buy. Um, if you knew the name of the premium car wash, which is, could be premium or super, uh, you could actually uh, adjust what's getting sent into there. And this post request will actually put uh, a soap operation at the very end, right? So you're finished with your car wash, the thing comes over one last time, it just soaps your car up, and then uh, your car is just full of soap and you have to leave the car wash. So uh, another thing that's kind of interesting is there's particular, you know, when you're looking at something like this, this talk is called when IoT attacks, right? So uh, I was looking for instances where you could actually take control of a car wash and maybe try to cause harm to someone or to harm to property, right? And so uh, usually when you're looking at something like that, you have to sit down and think about where are some design considerations that they didn't think about or they didn't understand that could actually cause someone harm. Uh, and the interesting thing is they actually did give thought to where this device could actually hurt or harm someone. Uh, in fact, in the owner or service manual, they draw attention to these, uh, these situations and these scenarios. Like for example, there are sensors that try to prevent basically uh, the, the striking of a vehicle or the closing of a door on a vehicle or a person, uh, and, but uh, you're also allowed to basically disable those sensors. Uh, but when you look at the owner or service manuals, it says, hey, uh, you probably shouldn't do this because if you do do this, uh, then bad things could happen, right? Uh, and they're literally just one post request away. So if we want to disable sensors, the safety sensors on this particular thing, uh, because we want to shut a door on some vehicle that's driving in or out, I mean, this is how we would do it, right? It's pretty straightforward. Um, there's also like, hey, I want to open and close a door. Because uh, a lot of folks don't realize this, but the actual car wash itself is controlled by this brain unit that we're talking about. Uh, but the bay doors are actually also part of the car wash as well. And so the bay doors can be controlled by that central unit as well. So you can actually open and shut the doors. And the slide that we showed before 
um, actually showed how you would disable the sensors to make it to where if someone was trying to drive out as you're closing a door, uh, how you could do that via post request. But uh, there's also ways to basically shut and, and, and shut and open all the doors, right? So like this command right here, instant 16, shuts both doors. So the front door and the back door. Um, if you were inside of the bay getting a car wash, uh, it soaked you up, uh, it won't rinse off, and both bay doors shut, um, I think that would be pretty scary, right? Uh, that'd be a pretty scary uh, instance. Uh, you can also do a lot of other things too, like you can actually configure the tolerances for the device. Because at the end of the day, it's really just a machine. And sometimes machines actually need you to help them understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And so there's a lot of moving parts in here. Uh, there's a, the bridge on top and a trolley. Um, it's going to want to know what your tolerances are as far as where it should be or how far it should move, how fast it should move. Uh, and all this is configurable, right? So uh, this should only be done by, you know, qualified maintenance professionals. But um, if you have a shell, if you have access to this web interface, you're going to be able to do this by design even if you don't know what you're doing, right? So uh, a lot of different things you can modify here. A lot of different things. Uh, so I don't know what happens if you set the voltage to incorrect voltage. Uh, but just taking a look at the site voltage, uh, 380 volts, uh, that's, that's a lot of electricity like flying through. And I know, you know it's the amps that kills you, but when we're talking about voltage like that, it's pretty, this is a pretty serious machine. Um, and so I think the one place where you could actually really cause harm to someone, hurt someone, uh, damage a device or a truck or a car that's coming through is actually the movement operations, right? That's the most obvious place uh, that you can do. And, and this is also by design, right? So... Um, it actually tells you, hey, um, if you're going to do a manual movement uh, via the joystick or the web interface, you have to be really careful because you're in complete control of this machine, right? And if you move it in a way that it's not intended to be moved or if there's something in the way, uh, whatever that thing is, is it's going to get damaged or someone's going to get hurt, right? So um, I'm actually not going to share that post request with you. But uh, I will share a story with you about that. So uh, one of the things that kind of sparked my interest in these car washes was uh, I actually have a friend who uh, worked at a chain of stores that had car washes. Uh, and he actually told me a story of, of a person that actually came to service one of the car washes. And they got one of the tolerances wrong. And one, what ended up happening was for a minivan that had come through, the car wash arm had actually broken the side window of the minivan. And it was just spraying water into the minivan. And I guess there's a, a, a child in the back in a car seat. And so uh, the owner of the van panicked and j literally just drove out of the car wash uh, with this thing spinning. And it actually damaged the car wash. Uh, along with the van, obviously. No one got hurt. Um, the owner of this organization actually ended up buying that person a new, new vehicle, and they just ended up shutting down the car wash, right? So uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, these machines are very dangerous, right? And typically when we have these machines installed someplace, um, they're only meant to be operated by qualified technicians and people who really know what they're doing. Uh, and by design, if we get something wrong, or if we get something incorrect, uh, we could end up hurting someone, and actually it's already happened, right? So and when we start putting these things online and connecting them, uh, it changes our threat model dramatically, right? So then there's one other thing that I also want to talk to people about. So uh, this is, I think, the most difficult thing for people to conceptualize. So we talked about by design functionality that's available inside the car wash, right? So, uh, but there is a lot of things that are available that are not by design. So for example, if we look at the bottom there, um, we can actually put this thing into like a debug mode, right? Uh, and if we take a look at what's going on here, there's a bunch of different things that are connected to this car wash, right? Uh, and so, like for example, this. Um, when we look at this, anyone that's done ICS security or has worked in like critical infrastructure or anything like that, uh, they will recognize these types of things. Uh, these are devices connected via Modbus to that centralized controller, right? So if we take a, a closer look here, uh, specifically there's three different devices that are connected via Modbus to the centralized controller. It's likely the bridge, uh, the trolley, and the bay doors. Right? And um, if we take a closer look, it's an uh, Altivar. Right? Does anyone know what an Altivar is? If Mike Tucker was in here, he would know what it is. Uh, Altivar is just a, a variable frequency drive. You will find this variable frequency drive anywhere, like in critical infrastructure. If you went to a power plant, you'd probably find a VFD someplace. Um, if you did anything with ICS, you would know what a VFD is. So uh, the point here is um, there are things that are built into this device you know, the ways to move the bridge, the ways to move the trolley, the ways to rotate the trolley. Um, that's all by design. We can actually initiate that kind of stuff via post requests uh, by taking advantage of the by design interfaces that are offered to us. Uh, once we're underneath the operating system, we can make the VFD do whatever we want. So if the software says, hey, I'm only going to allow the trolley to move at three miles an hour, 
Um, that is not a restriction that's enforced by the VFD. If we just go to the Modbus level and just say, hey, I'm going to send Modbus packets to this VFD and say, move as quickly as you can to the center of, the, to the center of your access and rotate um, the trolley as quickly as you can over and over and over until I tell you to stop, uh, this VFD will do that, right? All it's expecting is just frequency changes from it. So whatever it's controlling, uh, we'll be able to have control over that thing in a way that's probably never been intended by the person who manufactured this device. And so uh, this is the part that probably gave me the most uh, difficult time here. So um, I was like, hey, you know what? We should probably have a slide that says this is what makers should think about, right? If you're making devices like this, uh, this is probably what you should think about. And obviously, the first part is, hey, remote access changes your threat model, right? Uh, but the last piece is like, hey, just take care of your SQL, your buffer overflows, your command injection, your hard-coded passwords, and you probably might be OK, right? And so um, I think everyone kind of ends with a, a slide like this uh, when they talk about IoT security or ICS security, talking about working with vendors and things like that. Uh, but to be honest, uh, I think the advice for everyone else is, well, I don't think we can trust the makers. Right? So the people who made that car wash, um, they're not going to understand any of that stuff that we just talked to them about. Right? Like SQL injection, the, you know, how we can take over Modbus and utilize our device in ways that it was never intended, uh, preventing SQL, uh, uh, SQL injections or buffer overflows or command injections. They're not going to understand that. Uh, and what's also sad is their customers are probably not going to understand that, demand that either. Right? It's going to be a gas station someplace um, that has no idea as to how to correctly audit this particular device for security. Uh, and then we're going to start to see this in other IoT places as well, right? So, um, you know, do we want to keep doing this treadmill of trying to discover vulnerabilities and helping people and then reporting to vendors and hoping that they fix or raising awareness with consumers? Um, and I'm starting to think that that's probably the wrong approach, right? So we know for a fact that um, if a device have, has moving parts, um, if it has a, a variable frequency drive inside of it that controls something that's industrial, it can probably be a, a huge safety issue. Uh, and making it so where the consumer uh, has to, you know, beware and demand security from those devices or making it so where we trust the vendor to do the right thing, um, I'm not so sure if that's the right approach anymore, especially with a situation like this. Um, I doubt the, the small company that makes these car washes is going to invest heavily in security. Um, I doubt that the uh, gas stations that buy these, these types of car washes uh, are going to be interested in that as well. So uh, just one case study of one particular uh, device uh, but I think, you know, those last pieces that we just talked about probably extend to other uh, industries as well. So I have two minutes left. So I don't know if there's any questions. I already showed you how to get free car washes, so it's, it's already in slides. <laughs> yeah. Uh, looking at the firmware for this uh, particular car wash since like 2012. So maybe like the last four or five years total? I'm not sure. I don't know when the first one uh, came online. I'm not, I'm not certain. Um, I do know that that functionality to like, control it when, while you're standing at the car wash, that's probably been there since uh, these things were first designed. Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. And I also know that you know, I, had, I had a slide uh, on this. I took it out. That particular car wash that I talked to you about, there's about 250 of those online. Um, all total, I mean, when I say online, like facing the internet right now, um, all total, other car washes, I don't know, maybe in the thousands. So uh, pretty interesting. They're definitely out there. Yeah. Did you get much of a sense of how many operators are actually using the access as opposed to just doing it in the way that they've done it? No idea. No idea. There's actually, um, there's actually a little a bullet here that says, hey, we will eventually get your firmware. Um, I wanted to talk to some, some folks about that. We will eventually get the firmware for devices we're interested in. Um, even if it means convincing our single friends to befriend a woman that's working at a gas station uh, in order to get just a quick little access to the uh, car wash. Just saying. So, yeah, but I'm not okay. sure how many people actually use remote interfaces to manage this stuff.